Hello, uh, it's Dr. Eric Potter, Functional MD, back for another Facebook Live. Uh, this is Thursday, uh, April 11th. We are going to be talking about, I think it is 11th. Yes, I am correct. It is 11th, so I'm at the right day and at the right place in front of a camera talking to you about Alzheimer's and mold toxicity. Uh, so I hope uh, those of you who are wanting to join are having an opportunity now to get online. Uh, we will keep an eye on if there's any volume issues, just let us know uh, so that way we can make adjustments. Uh, we had little technical changes this morning. Uh, it's been a uh, rough last couple of days as uh, we've been dealing with our own uh, mold issues in our home. Uh, so just bear with me. I'm going to do the best I can. Uh, a little tired like uh, many of you who face mold toxicity know it can be uh, as if you are being chased. I will definitely say that's how we feel right now, is being pursued. So with that, though, uh, I do want to uh, give you the little disclaimer we always give. This is an educational session. Uh, this is not about diagnosing or treating uh, any of the illnesses that you have, uh, including Alzheimer's or mold toxicity, or making uh, specific treatment uh, recommendations. Uh, if you are one of our patients, ask us that question. If it's something we uh, mentioned here is right for you. Uh, if you're not, uh, we'd be glad to uh, have you as one of our patients to help you through these kind of issues. Stephen uh, at 615-815-5941 can help with that. But uh, if not, then make sure you talk to your doctor whether these therapies are appropriate for you. So let's dig into a little uh, about, as always, about the topic uh, for 10 to 20 minutes, and then we will answer some questions. We have a few that have already been sent in, uh, but we will also take those as we're going through uh, to answer as we can, as many as possible. So Alzheimer's disease or Alzheimer's dementia, uh, about 5.7 million Americans uh, of all ages are living with Alzheimer's dementia uh, as of 2018, so last year. Looking for, oh, where did I just, looking for one thing real quick. There we go. All right, looking for a technical problem there, so we'll get back to business. So, in 2018, uh, so in, it's considered the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Uh, so, it is a fatal disease uh, that can be anywhere from five to eight years, or some patients will live 10 to 12, 15 years, but uh, it often, uh, as I've heard some others say, is you don't find survivors of Alzheimer's. Uh, you find someone who is on a downward spiral. And then in 2018, Alzheimer's and other dimensions uh, likely uh, cost the nation, uh, both in healthcare, lost wages, and so forth, about $277 billion. Uh, that's a quarter of a trillion dollars. And of that total lifetime cost for caring someone for someone with dementia, about 70% is actually borne by the family. So either through out-of-pocket health care and long-term care expenses or from the value, uh, value lost of unpaid care uh, where they could have been productive somewhere else. Although we do encourage families to participate, uh, your loved one, if they have dementia, is going to be better cared for you, uh, if at all possible, until uh, you are not able to provide that care anymore. And then the current paradigm about Alzheimer's disease is there's nothing that will prevent it reverse it or slow the progress. Uh, we're going to mm, argue against that today. But what is dementia in the first place? It's not really a specific disease. Uh, it's an overall term. It describes a group of symptoms associated with a decline, decline in memory or other thinking skills. It's severe enough to reduce a person's ability to perform everyday activities. They have difficulty caring for themselves uh, either in work or even self-care uh, activities. It affects their memory. Uh, can, affects communication and language, their ability to pay attention, uh, to focus on things, to fo uh, focus on reading, focus on what you're saying to them. Uh, it affects the reasoning and judgment, uh, so the decision-making uh, abilities are impaired, uh, and affects visual perception, uh, so they have trouble gauging distance, they may have more falls, uh, they will, um, so it's perception not just what they're hearing and taking in communication, but even visual. With that, Alzheimer's is more of a process. It is a progressive cell and structural, structural degeneration of the brain tissue uh, that interferes with function. Uh, it involves growth and spread of plaques and tangles. 
uh, in the nerve cells uh, that can lead to cell death and synapse dysfunction. So just a quick uh, note is synapse are the connections between your nerve cells, the nerve cells being the ones that actually do the thinking. Your brain is also filled with a lot of other cells uh, that either provide support or protection for the nerve cells that do the thinking uh, processing part. Uh, all of these cells can be involved in this, but it is the nerve cells damage which causes the actual symptoms of um, not being able to think, remember, uh, interact. Um, so all those symptoms result from this physiologic biologic process. <clears throat> so we're going to talk for a moment uh, about kind of mold and uh, toxic mold toxicity overlap with dementia. Uh, so one of the types that we're going to talk about uh, dementias is the toxic form. Um, this probably the most common is going to be mold, but there are also other toxins that include things like metals. Uh, Lyme toxicity, Lyme disease toxicity, uh, other organic toxins can cause similar issues with a toxic form of dementia. Uh, these patients typically have an onset a little earlier, under 65, whereas your kind of classic Alzheimer's is after that age. They are usually APOE4 negative. We'll take a moment now, just uh, APOE is a gene uh, that many are aware of. They think of it as the Alzheimer's gene. Uh, that if you have that copy of four, you have an increased rate of Alzheimer's disease and it can often uh, have an earlier onset uh, in many of the familial cases uh, where several family members over generations have that, uh, they have APOE4. It affects your cholesterol, it affects other uh, aspects of brain function. So what I'm saying, in toxic patients with Alzheimer's type dementia or dementia, uh, it's usually an APOE3 copy that normally you would think of as being the average risk for Alzheimer's. So it is not what you would think, and therefore you don't often see that in generations unless generations have exposed to mold toxicity. You often see low triglycerides uh, and or zinc. Uh, so that's other things when we're looking, uh, we'll talk in a moment about a functional medicine approach to dementia is we will look at uh, high triglycerides, high cholesterol uh, can contribute to vascular uh, dementia. Uh, zinc and other deficiencies, nutrients, minerals, vitamins can cause uh, mood, memory, uh, thinking changes. Uh, in this, uh, particularly when patients are toxic, causing dementia, uh, they have uh, hypothalamic pituitary axis dysfunction. Again, another big word, but it's really simple. It's what your brain uh, is telling hormonal signals down to your pituitary, who then sends out uh, to the adrenal glands, uh, affecting cortisol. How much, too little or too, uh, too much can cause problems. Too much cortisol interferes with the ability to form new memories. Too little ca can cause fatigue uh, and cause um, difficulties with the brain uh, regenerating and healing well. Uh, often these toxic patients also have depression symptoms, uh, mood disorders. Uh, it can be very depressing, both the symptoms and just the fact the toxins themselves trigger inflammation that cause depression. These patients will have a lot of trouble with math or organizational or word finding problems. So math being, they may not be able to balance their checkbook. Uh, they may uh, have trouble counting money when they're going to the store. Uh, or organizational things as they start losing things, they misplace things, they can't keep things uh, straight uh, in their home or in work situation. And word finding means they're looking for a word. They can't think that one word. They're like, they know what they want to say. They can kind of picture it, but they can't get that word out. Uh, many times that is this. Now, just because you are disorganized, just because you don't do great in math, and just because you uh, can't think of a word now and then, don't get anxious that you have dementia or that you have mold toxicity. Uh, these are all things that uh, we all at intermittent times say we're under stress, may have trouble finding a word, or uh, we're tired from not getting enough sleep and don't organize as well or have trouble with math. These are all things that when they're to an extreme, um, interfering with life level and they're repeated in patterns, that's when we're more concerned that someone is having dementia. So we then look and see if they have exposure to toxins. Again, mercury, mold toxins, things like Lyme, uh, Marcons, which is a type of bacteria that you can see in patients with mold toxicity, um, surgical implants. So sometimes metal implants can be a problem uh, or someone with chronic viral infections. 
Uh, this can be precipitated or exacerbated by stress. Um, it's kind of an atypical Alzheimer's, often with frontal effects uh, and imaging changes that are a little bit different. Uh, in these patients, uh, we will look for things like a high C4A, a high TGF beta 1, uh, low melanocyte stimulating hormone, look for genetics of the HLA DR slash DQ. Uh, it makes patients more sensitive to biotoxins. Uh, again, we will test for things like marcons, the bacteria, and the sciences that can release chemicals that make people sick. Uh, and then we will look for staphylococcus uh, cultures as well. And we will consider using a visual contrast sensitivity. Um, and surprisingly, most do not have allergic symptoms to mold. Uh, most do not uh, fulfill criteria either for chronic inflammatory response syndrome uh, that younger patients will have from mold. Uh, yet they'll have these lab uh, abnormalities. So in other words, they don't have the full-blown symptomatology list that mold patients often have. It just may be a focus in their neurologic symptom systems. And we may call this an innate system immune stimulation, ISIS instead of CIRS, SIRS. There is a potential relationship to Lewy, Lewy body disease, which I know one of the questions is about that. Uh, it is one of the more difficult uh, types of Alzheimer's disease to treat successfully. Um, but then why treat? You know, the current paradigm, conventional medicine thinks, oh, you cannot treat it. It's just uh, inevitable. Uh, because the conventional medicine will look at, oh, here's some medicine to try to slow it, kind of manage the symptoms, but it's not really about getting at the root cause. Well, let's think about statistics. High death rate, high disability rate, there's a lot of family costs, so a huge impact on the families trying to care for these patients, and the national cost. Uh, as, this, as our population ages and more and more get uh, dementia uh, because of the toxicities and other issues we live in, um, it's going to become a huge burden on our society. But in fact, we can slow or reverse Alzheimer's. So how do you treat it? Now, I'm going to read through a long list, but if you really want to understand the complexity lying behind uh, Alzheimer's disease, uh, dementia, uh, here's what the perfect drug, if there was a drug, pharmaceutical drug, or any therapy developed, here's what we need to do. And some of these just ignore the fact there's a lot of uh, acronyms, but just get a big picture of you need to reduce APP, beta cleavage, reduce G cleavage, increase A cleavage, reduce caspase C, 6 cleavage, reduce caspase 3 cleavage, prevent oligomerization, increase nephrolysin, increase IDE, increase microglial clearance of antibody, increase autophagy, increase BDMF, brain derived neurotrophic factor, increase NGF, Increase netrin 1, increase ADMP, reduce homocysteine, increase PP2A activity. All right, that's enough. That I'm about halfway down the list. Uh, maybe even only a third of all the things that you need to do to help uh, all the factors that play a role in dementia. That would be like uh, if you go in and you're doing um, repairing something, it's not just, oh, it just replaces one part. It is multiple factors, and each patient we see has a multitude of those factors playing a role in there, so therefore we need to check all of those. Uh, so it's a very complex disease, uh, so we need to go beyond the conventional uh, approach of just ruling out reversible causes, which are B12, folate, um, a couple other things, uh, and just throwing pharmaceuticals at a per person. So that functional medicine approach is going to be looking for more reversible causes, managing ones. So really there's five types, although technically it's six because one gets kind of split in two. Um, one, type one, is inflammatory. Uh, this can be many causes from chronic infections or sterile infection, uh, sterile uh, inflammation. Uh, 1.5, kind of the split here, is glycotoxic. Uh, so this can be the effect of diabetes, and some would even call uh, Alzheimer's type three diabetes of the brain, in which the brain can't handle glucose uh, appropriately. There's the H number two is atrophic, uh, which is due to lack of hormones or the effect of hormones. Toxic uh, is metals, organic toxins, mold, and others that we talked about earlier. Uh, the vascular, stroke, uh, many strokes or other blood vessel issues. And then five is trauma, uh, concussions uh, over time trigger inflammatory responses that can then cause dementia. So a functional medicine approach is comprehensive and personalized. Most, if not all, cases are mixtures of these things. 
So we often talk with patients who, oh, they in high school or in young adulthood, they had a concussion uh, and then they had an Epstein bar infection six months later and then they lived, moved into a house with mold toxicity, mold toxins, uh, or then they had, um, they got into their 50s and started, had, went through menopause and uh, had brain function decreased at that point as hormones were uh, waxing and waning. Uh, so really, it's like a, a roof with 36 holes in it. Just fixing a few of them does not do any real good. You really need to look at all the holes that potentially could be contributed to dementia. So we start with lifestyle. So we want to make sure we're optimizing diet, which includes a low inflammatory diet, anti-inflammatory diet. Uh, there's not a one-size-fits-all, oh, everybody should be on paleo, or everybody should be on ketogenic, or everybody should be on a low histamine diet, or everybody needs to do this. Each person is a little different. We have some patients who can tolerate a paleo or a ketogenic diet and do very well, and that sharpens the brain. Others, because of genetic issues that we sometimes test for, uh, like ACAT or SLA, SLC22A5, uh, may not handle carnitine and therefore cannot handle fats, uh, and they don't do well when they're eating a high-fat diet like in the ketogenic. Uh, so in those that can, we will look at using ketogenesis. A ketogenic diet can be helpful. We work on reducing stress, which balances the cortisol. Optimizing sleep. If they are not getting regenerative sleep, uh, where their brain can restore, uh, they are not going to be thinking well. Uh, sometimes there's some things you can do to brain stimulation, uh, even just simple crossword puzzles. Uh, exercise uh, is a huge thing that gets more blood flow to your brain, helps lower inflammation, uh, and clear out some of those toxins. Coconut oil uh, can be part of ketogenesis and also just as part of healthy brain fuel, uh, as our brain actually likes ketones uh, a little better than they like glucose, as long as you can process, process those genetically. And we'll look at antioxidants. So antioxidants, things like the vitamins that lower inflammation and help our body heal up from inflammation that is occurring. So just to keep things simple, functional medicine approach is really simple. It's a simple paradigm. You want to look at too little, too much, the gut, and psychosocial. With too little, we'll look at whether there's too little nutrients, different vitamins. We'll look at whether there's too little blood flow or too little hormones. Uh, all those things we will address. Uh, you can do replace deficiencies. You can help increase blood flow with nitric oxide uh, stimulators, and you can replace hormones going through andropause or menopause. Um, then we look at things too much, or the toxic side, type 3 toxins, type 1 and a half, too much glucose with diabetes, type 1, too much inflammation or infection. Uh, and type 2, again, is hormones and the fact that you can have too much cortisol uh, contributing to brain decline. In GI, we are going to look at inflammation uh, from the diet, dysbiosis, bad bacteria that's causing issues, uh, leaky gut, look for infection, look for malabsorption, uh, all things that contribute to brain effects. Uh, and if you're having leaky gut, you're probably having leaky brain. It's the same process as holding uh, those cells together. Then we also look at psychosocial factors, so stress, relationships, again, exercise can be huge, sleep, uh, and mental exercise. Uh, these are all the factors we are going to take into consideration. Uh, and when we, when we treat, we expect it may be a one to three years for improvement. Uh, success depends on what we find. Uh, some, like we talked about, mold toxicity may be more difficult to treat. Um, when getting those toxins out, patients may have had 20, 30, 40, 50 years of toxin exposure. Uh, you're not going to remove those toxins in two months uh, like you might with kids who may get better just for getting away and taking a few detox therapies. They may bounce back. Adults often don't, especially if it's to the point of infecting and causing dementia. Uh, and in this case, if that person who is impaired, uh, it may take a whole lot of help and support from the family such that they probably will not be able to do this without that kind of support. So with that, uh, I've gotten through kind of the introduction, uh, hopefully a good idea of Alzheimer's and uh, a little idea of how mold toxins can affect that and how we treat those. Uh, so we're going to take um, about the next, um, what, 35 minutes or so and answer as many questions as we can. Um, with that, I'm going to start with what we have that uh, some uh, they have sent, others have sent in before. Um, can Lewy body dementia be caused by mold? So let's, this is a, a longer question, so we're going to kind of break this up. So thank you, uh, Tina. Uh, so there, there is not a definite connection proven at this point. 
uh, that is definitely a possibility in terms of a lot of the symptoms from um, mold-induced dementia can overlap with Lewy body uh, dementia. So if we have a patient with that, we would look for mold toxicity and treat it with the hopes that we would see improvement in their dementia. Um, but, and also the fact is nobody really knows exactly what causes Lewy body dementia. Uh, we're going to do what we can from a functional medicine approach and not get caught up in labels. And just because somebody's given that name uh, by another doctor, we're not going to try to do the same functional medicine root cause approach that we always do. Um, what would you recommend for someone who has been diagnosed with this disease? All right, we're back. Hopefully, um, we're going to stay online this time. I'm not uh, sure what happened. We will look back and sort that out later. Uh, but I'm going to give everybody a moment to get back online uh, so they can get caught up. Uh, and I'm going to start over a little bit uh, on Tina's question uh, about Lewy body dementia. Uh, and we were talking about, since I don't know where we actually got caught off there, uh, Ernie and her team scores on a Swiffer test or a vacuum test where you can collect dust samples um, in your home, work, car, any environment, and send that in. Um, there's several companies that do this, but they will tell you if you have high levels of water damage type molds, uh, and also whether or not you have the bad molds like Aspergillus, Ketonium, Molymii, Stachybotrys, the so-called black mold, um, tell you if those levels are high enough that they might be causing symptoms. And yes, a level of 20 to 24, definitely about 15 are enough to cause toxic toxicity for those who are sensitive. Uh, and again, sensitive patients means that they have genetics in which they are not able to um, get rid of those toxins, identify them inside, and um, destroy them. With that, uh, what we're looking at is um, a hurts me in 2024. Could be enough that there's toxins in that environment to make that person sick. Now, ideally, if that person is willing to entertain that idea, they should get tested uh, to see if they are reacting just because you're, some patients, people, will be around that uh, level of toxins and not be affected because their HLA genetics um, enable them to identify and get rid of those toxins. So it's not an absolute uh, that you'll be sick. But if you do have symptoms, uh, they do need to be tested for things like C4A, TGF-beta-1. Uh, we don't start with the urine mycotoxin testing through the beginning, but we might incorporate that later. And from there is considering a time if they can get away from that environment where there's a low mold exposure and see if they find improvement. Now, for an adult, especially with dementia, that improvement may require one to two years before they know they're any better. Uh, it's a slow process where some, if they're children or 20s and 30s, they'll know in a few weeks or a month or two uh, being out of that environment if they uh, have symptom improvement. Uh, so in the case of dementia, that is really not as good an option. Um, that you know, requires moving for a long term uh, before you'd see any difference. And then again, if you're not helping them get rid of those toxins, they, those toxins may be enough that even after two years, they're not noticing improvement. Uh, further question here was my immediate family is currently dealing with mold health issues. So why we tested our in-laws home next door. Uh, scores are from my in-laws home. I don't know what that they would be open to thinking that Lewy body could be caused by mold, the evidence research it can point them to uh, suggestions. So um, normally I would have a list of references. I'm going to try to still put that together for this, but with all our own, uh, my own family's uh, challenges right now with mold in our environment, uh, I've not had the ability to do that, uh, being focused on them the past week. So I will try to get back, but there are some resources out there that do indicate some um, neurologic symptoms can be related to mold toxicity. Uh, the next question is from, looks like Diane. Uh, what do you suggest for someone who has done the rec recode workup, has a questionable neuroquant, but can't find a local neurologist who understands this? So first of all, neuroquant is a type of measurements uh, using an MRI of different parts of the brain. Uh, our brain is divided up into different sections. Uh, and looking at that, you can often, not always, but often get a sense of what uh, pathological disease-causing process is occurring, whether it's Lyme, mold, traumatic brain injury, or other things. Uh, with that, though, not many neurologists in the mainline uh, conventional world recognize that, although there's good research on it. Uh, so hopefully we'll have more that do recognize that in the coming years. Uh, so this is something where you would want someone who is comfortable looking at neuroquant, like with mold toxicity or something like that. 
Uh, also, I have a 14-year-old son who has a growth in the pituitary gland. And I realize it may be related. He also has brain issues, but unfortunately, he and my husband do not believe mold is the issue and will not get tested. Both my daughter and I test positive for the two HLA mold susceptibility genes, so I assume my son has it too. We also have NGHR, HFR variations, which I believe is compounding the issue. So let's walk through just clarification. So uh, pituitary uh, mass growth tumor may or may not be related to mold at all. Uh, but it could be if it's dysregulating the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, there could be some issues there. So uh, they would want to go through a standard workup with ACTH cortisol levels. Uh, but uh, touching on the fact that, yes, some of the other symptoms, just because someone has a pituitary tumor doesn't mean every symptom they have is from that. Uh, so we want to look further, especially given that since you and your daughter have HLA genes uh, associated with mold toxicity, is there is potential that... Um, Yes, your son, your husband may or may not, but your son, but if your daughter has different ones from you, then it must have been from dad, so dad may have those as well. Uh, so looking at that is trying to encourage them, providing them some information. Uh, again, as we offer bibliography support, we can help patients uh, get more research and more understanding to how to help family or friends uh, with their issues. Um, now, MTHFR. Uh, methylene tetrafolate reductase uh, is something that kind of got me partly into the functional medicine world in terms of uh, methylation. Uh, you use that to process, produce, process, and break down a lot of different chemicals uh, in your body and also to control your genes turning on and off. With that in mind, uh, we want to make sure someone's methylation is handling, doing well because it also uh, connected, is connected to glutathione production. Glutathione is one of the ways that our body attempts to detox from uh, mold. Uh, it doesn't work well enough if your HLA is abnormal. However, uh, we do want that to be good because we often give some uh, glutathione support uh, to help get the mold toxins out in your urine. Uh, but we want to make sure your other body systems are working as well. Uh, so that would be a consideration, making sure they're getting adequate riboflavin, B2, methylfolate, methyl B12, magnesium, and other nutrients. Uh, next question is, if you're concerned you may have mold toxicity, what besides mold should you be avoiding? I'm mainly thinking of foods. Recently looked in the protein shake I was consuming daily because of a post I think I saw from you about heavy metals and protein powders. I was also alarmed to find out there are often many mold toxins in them. Do you have a suggestion to replace these shakes that are not dairy-based? So let's talk about food. So there's not clear research for humans if mold toxins at what normally uh, normal levels we find in our food supply are sufficient to cause this toxicity. Part of the difficulty is if you did a population study without taking into consideration someone's HLA detox genetics for mold, um, it would you know three quarters of people have no problems getting rid of that and would not be an issue, so it wouldn't show up and you couldn't tell the difference. However, uh, when we're looking at patients that have those genetics, uh, some of those may or may not have enough mold toxin exposure in their diet that does make them sick. I do have some patients who definitely can tell if they drink the wrong coffee or if they eat moldy food, they have some uh, tendencies towards mold, uh, aged cheeses, uh, fermented foods. Uh, often they can have symptoms. They can have exacerbations of the same mold uh, symptoms. Now, the other issue with a lot of those fermented foods is they have histamines, uh, and a lot of our mold toxic patients are very sensitive to histamines, and we will sometimes put them on a low histamine diet. Um, foods can either trigger the release of histamine that's already there, they can provide the building blocks for histamine, or they can have some histamine in them when they're fermented. Uh, any protein uh, sitting around long enough has potential for ferment if it's uh, fermenting, if it's wet, uh, into something that would be uh, histamine triggering. Uh, so with that, we look at histamines possibility, uh, we look at the digestive system, uh, and we help them sort out identifying at least what foods have some mold in them, uh, and if they notice those make them sick, to pull those back, but at the very least tell them not to eat too much of those foods, uh, even if they don't notice it might cause some mild problems. So with that, in your particular question about protein powders, uh, we'll often uh, recommend pea protein powder. Uh, or uh, there's some hemp-based ones out there, some other vegetarian uh, protein powders. Uh, being careful with soy, uh, it can have some estrogenic effects uh, for women and for men. Um, so being careful with soy proteins is one of those vegetarians. Uh, and also, again, uh, 
being careful on whey or casein protein uh, triggering dairy sensitivities. Uh, so for now, there's no guarantee that whatever particular brand I told you today, uh, next week doesn't get reported. So oh, we found so and so in that uh, metals or whatever. We do need to keep our eyes open. Uh, so at this point, I would say looking for the pea. If you're not sensitive to pea uh, protein, uh, and considering hemp protein uh, as another good source uh, that has mostly upsides and few downsides to it. Um, another question: um, What do you recommend for control of mold in the basement? I'm spraying to make sure of bleach and water periodically. So let's talk uh, in a moment about remediation. It's something that always comes up and looks extremely important. First of all, why is it important? Uh, if you have someone who has mold toxicity and they're still in the midst of the mold, you can get a little bit of it out, but it's still coming in the this door and it, you don't really get very far and often you make them sicker. Uh, so our first goal is always to separate the person from the toxin, whether it's mercury uh, in amalgams, whether it's mold, whether it's whatever toxin it is, if you're working in a uh, toxic organic solvent plant. Uh, from there, uh, how do you keep them in mold? Because often it's in your homes, uh, it can be in your workplace. Uh, how do you clean mold when you find it? Because technically, yes, there's mold everywhere. Uh, it's around us, uh, and we can't 100% avoid all of it. First of all, not all molds produce toxins. Many just cause us sniffle, sneeze, not wheeze with allergies. Um, we may be allergic to it, but they're not toxic. Uh, so a lot of the dry molds, a lot of the outdoor molds that don't have those issues. Or even if they do, uh, the wind blows their toxins away, and it's not a problem. It's a water-damaged building uh, where the gases build up inside. The, molds that grow on drywall, wood, carpet, things like that, books, and, uh, paper products, and so forth. Those are the ones that produce more toxins. From there, what do you spray on it? Uh, so I'm going to say not bleach. So bleach is a high percentage of water. What do molds like the most? Water. What happens when the bleach is gone? Yes, you just took the color out of it, and it looks like it's gone, but actually you just left some water behind such that there will be some other mold come back and live behind that, if you happen to even kill off the first round completely. So you don't want to use a bleach product. Uh, you can look at some hydrogen peroxide-based products uh, if they're not high percent of water. You can look at a lot of essential oil-based products. Um, you can even diffuse uh, certain types of essential oils uh, that blends of some citrus, tea tree, different ones where they will uh, stop mold growth. Uh, you can use cleaners made from those essential oil products. Um, so there's a lot of different things without getting into particular ones. There's several different ones and they kind of have, um, depending on what you're using it for, can be better. Um, there are some out there that will definitely kill mold, but you want to be careful that they don't leave phosphates behind, which then that person may be uh, sensitive to phosphates, or they may leave other chemicals behind that causes allergies or sensitivities. Uh, so you want to, you, there's uh, some different ones out there. Um, <clears throat> if you're a patient, we advise you on that, but still give you some options and rather than getting tied up to a single brand because it may not be the right thing for you. And that's why having a remediator uh, that you trust uh, involved in that can tell you whether that certain chemical, that certain product is appropriate for the situation you're having. Now, you're also kind of asking what can you do on an ongoing basis? We would recommend a thieves oil type cleaner. You can make some, you can buy that, or you can make some on your own for some online recipes. Uh, what that can do is leave the residue of those essential oils behind uh, and get rid of that. But first you want to make sure you got rid of the initial part uh, and then to keep it from coming back, those types of essential oils work very well. Uh, so my next question from Judy. Husband has memory problems. Tests have shown a nodule on his thyroid. He's been tested as non-cancerous. However, his GP, uh, general practitioner, said it was possibly causing his thyroid to be hyperactive and also causing dizziness. His episodes of shakiness and affecting his memory. Could that be causing his problems? Uh, so I, again, I would not hazard a guess on diagnosing or treatment treating someone based on a short interaction. Our uh, first visits with patients, uh, if you've not been to our office, uh, are 90 minutes. Of, and that's after you filled out a long questionnaire online that helps us know your health as well as possible uh, before you even step in the door. And then we spend 90 minutes doing history and physical and talking about the plan 
uh, with testing, and then we spend another 90 minutes when you come back uh, for that next visit to answer questions and talk about the program that we have put together personalized for you. With that, whether or not a nodule could be causing hyperthyroid, yes, it's possible. Uh, they would want to do a type of um, scan to see if it's a hyperactive nodule, and sometimes those do need to be uh, removed even though they're not cancerous. They're making too much hormone and can cause symptoms. Uh, I don't know if that's the case uh, if the hormone levels are high, uh, but yes, high hormone, uh, thyroid hormone levels could cause shakiness. Uh, in older individuals, uh, instead of having hypo, low thyroid symptoms, uh, are hyper symptoms from too much thyroid being released, they can actually have hypo. It's like over revving your car in the red zone too long, eventually it will wear out. So uh, many patients over 60 uh, will have hypo symptoms despite the fact they're hormones so that they are hyper. So that would be something I would want you to discuss with your uh, doctor. Um, another question from Jennifer. My mother passed away at 62 years of age, almost positive her cortisol levels were very high for years. And I don't see unless there's a further question from that that my assistant passed to me. If there was, that was it. And let me... Um, Let me answer this is, so cortisol being high can be from toxicity, it can be from uh, infections, it can be from um, purely hormonal issues, it can be from high stress. Uh, high cortisol will affect uh, a person's brain function uh, and causes other issues. Uh, so with that, is that is a problem um, that is something we often test for with saliva test uh, seeing what somebody's di what we call diurnal meaning that we're checking morning midday afternoon and evening uh, their levels of cortisol so uh, those are things that we do look at and we will consider that especially in terms of mold toxicity whether someone uh, is having dysregulation again of their hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis so uh, any i don't think we have any is that all the questions we have all right, I'm going to hang on if anybody out there has a question or two left. Um, we have a few more minutes. Uh, otherwise, we will wrap up uh, in preparation for our uh, talk on mold, uh, mold and keeping your home safe from it uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, so anybody want to throw out a last question or two before we move on? All right, I think I don't see any more questions, so thanks everyone for joining me. Uh, we look forward to our next one in two weeks, and I will see you then. Have a blessed day.